WPVM-FM at 103.7 here in Asheville, North Carolina. You can also listen on WPVM.org. This program is sponsored in part by the Mountain Coalition for Healthcare Decisions, and we're grateful for their support. I'm Greg Lathrop, and you're listening to Third Messenger Radio Hour, offering Asheville unique coverage, a global perspective on the culture of being with dying. Our segments include interviews, music, round-the-world coverage, and an ear on the conversation of the art of being with dying. Your future awaits. In the first paragraph of the first chapter of the book entitled The Mysticism of Sound and Music, the late Hazrat Anayat Khan proclaims the following. Music, the word we use in our everyday language, is nothing less than the picture of the beloved. It is because music is the picture of our beloved that we love music. But the question is, what is our beloved or where is our beloved? Our beloved is that which is our source and our goal. What we see in our beloved before our physical eyes is the beauty which is before us. That part of our beloved which is not manifest to our eyes is the inner form of beauty of which our beloved speaks to us. If only we would listen to the voice of all the beauty that attracts us in any form, we would find that in every aspect it tells us that behind all manifestation is the perfect spirit the spirit of wisdom. In this program, we will dive into the experience of cultivating the sacred art of being with dying through music. Today, we're talking with Jay Brown. He's a local musician and recording artist here in Asheville. And he's also a music therapy for care partners in hospice here. And he's he's agreed to come and share some of his stories and uh, uh, related to his music and to that work that he has with... uh, those, uh, those folks that uh, give him the opportunity to sit with them in that dying phase of living. And, and so, Jay, we're very grateful that you're here to share all of you, <laughs> as they might say. And, it's an uh, honor for me to be here to talk with you, Greg. Well, um, so, you know, the first question that comes to mind is, um, ultimately, I have watched your music and listened to your music. You, you certainly seem to be able to play... Uh, just about every instrument that's put in front of you, near as I can tell. As a matter of fact, you have a uh, production that is uh, in the line of a one-man uh, concert, right? Oh, yeah. I call myself a one-man band. The one-man band. Some of the band. time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe it. <laughs> so so you have, uh, you you hold your own uh your own band in your own right. And um, I know you play with another band as well. What's the name of that group? Well, I have a band called Lazy Birds that's been together for about 19 years. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. American roots, sort of upbeat, bluesy, and mm-hmm. country and all that. And then um, I play, um, my wife and I had a group called Shantavani, yes, which was more of an uh, Indian fusion group. Uh, uh-huh. DT is from India. And uh, we, we get together once in a while. Still yeah, that. yeah, yeah, that's um. So you so you are across the board in many different styles, uh, from what I can gather. Basically, old styles of it. I don't do. I don't mess around with too much with the modern stuff. <laughs> but if it's old, I probably play a little bit of it. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, that's in my uh, in my genre. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As my children would say, that that old music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, tell me about um. How how did it come about with you? Uh, did your parents, you know, uh, place a, a guitar in your lap when you were an infant? They, well, just about. Yeah, Dad uh, is a guitar player, and he gave he gave me a guitar. I think I was six, uh-huh. and uh, gave me lessons for a few months. Mm-hmm. And I was a pretty good student for a few months, and then I kind of got it. You know, I started doing karate or something like yeah. that. Uh-huh. But um, I think those those early lessons, you know, planted a seed. Mm-hmm. And then I would always pick up the guitar or play a little piano. And then, you know, around high school, it started to really get uh, get get into music a lot. 
Uh-huh. And I discovered Jimi Hendrix and the Rolling Stones and <laughs> Beatles yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Playing the, uh, pulling the electric out. A little bit. I never did get to be anything like, you know, Jimmy Page or Jimi Hendrix. But, <laughs> and I got into Dylan and then Simon and Garfunkel and, oh, um, yeah. and Old Blues and things like that. Uh-huh. Well, that's, um, so that brings you into, uh, through high school, you're, you're certainly found uh, that thing which uh, spoke to you the loudest, which was music, and uh, it seems, right? Yeah. Um, and so in relation to that, you move through uh, the rest of your life uh, through college. Eventually, college. Yeah, took a break. College, I took a long. Uh, I, I went to uh, did a little bit of college after high school, and uh-huh. then I, I moved up from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh-huh. I, I had taken a few classes at UAB. Right. Moved up with a bunch of uh, friends from Birmingham up to Boone, uh-huh. with the idea to go to App State. Started taking some uh, community college classes at Caldwell Community College. Right. And then started playing more and more gigs and playing with different people. There was a really a rich music scene in Boone at that time yeah. for the size of town. And uh, and then I was just, I remember one day I was I was I drove to the, my statistics class, <laughs> sat in the parking lot, and then sat there for about two minutes and then drove on home. And that was when I dropped out of college. So that was uh, that was after I'd been in for about a year and a half. Right. And then I took oh, about twelve years off. Oh yeah, it's just as a musician in Boone. Oh yeah, and that's what I did, living in little cabins and things like that, and just playing gigs and playing with the Lazy Birds and uh-huh. things like that. So that was a rich time, you know, just living solo most of the time, or at mm-hmm. least about half of that time. Uh-huh. It was just me and some books and some CDs and records in the cabin. Uh-huh. Yeah, and then um, when I met Aditi, we moved up to. Uh, Asheville uh-huh. and I was already starting to think about you know the idea of going back to school um, to, to study piano I really had an interest in learning classical piano right and I was also getting interested in music therapy as sort of a hobby uh-huh. you know playing in nursing homes and things like that uh-huh. and it was a Didi who mentioned well why don't you think about music therapy because they have a, a good program there at App State uh-huh. and since she was like the smartest person I know I, I thought well, <laughs> And maybe I should think about that. Uh-huh. And so that's what I did. And I went back to school and I did uh, focus on classical piano while I was there studying music therapy. Wow. Yeah. So that that's uh, you had an epiphany when it was time to go to statistics. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, yeah, exactly. I felt that. And I had to go. I had to go back and t- t- I had to end up taking statistics again yeah. when I went back like 12 years later. But. Then well, I was sort of ready, you know. <laughs> you were ready. You were. I don't know if I'd ever be ready for yeah, statistics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Oh, yeah. I honor you. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt that when you said you're coming for you're you're in this whole uh, you're in this whole musical uh, environment for many years and and or, or you're, you're you're doing that and then you're driving to statistics. I mean, I gutturally felt you that. Fit. <laughs> I was like, well, who could blame you? Hey, yeah, right. You got two options. and Who's going to pick statistics in the time? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that, you know, the music therapy came in after you met your wife. And um, um, related to that, you entered into, you were already, you said, playing with that a little bit by mm-hmm. making uh, some opportunities available in nursing homes and in places like that, right? Yeah, and I was, you know, I'd played music for, um, you know, relatives who were dying, and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and I was uh, had th- thought about taking a course at the end of life, uh, music at the end of life, which was sort of like a volunteer course, but it was still a long course that you had to take. Uh-huh. Um, so everything sort of pointed in that direction, right? You know? Right. Well, um, I'm glad it did. Um, yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you apply the music or the the principles of music um, with that relationship as a music therapist, tell me about what that is for you. What do you find that happens for you in the opportunity to do that the way you do? Sure. Well, um, the music therapy is really a vast field. Mm-hmm. There's so much, and um, I, I work in hospice, mm-hmm. and happen to work in these Appalachian Mountains around Asheville. So um, I feel like I'm just sort of in the perfect place for for who I am as a musician. 
um, mm-hmm. and a music therapist because the people that I meet often really they just love like the old Carter family songs yeah. and like the bluegrass and mm-hmm. um, gospel. So like mm-hmm. all these beautiful hymns that I always wanted to learn. You know, I grew up sort of Catholic, you know, and, but uh-huh. I was always really drawn to the old hymns. And so being immersed in all these great old hymns, you know, they're really powerful people who have, you know, that's been a big part of their life since they were, you know, infants or even when they were in utero. Yeah. Hearing these hymns is just really a powerful thing. So, you know, I'm really grateful to have that as a, as a uh, tool, mm-hmm. um, as a key to open a lot of doors. You know? And, um, and just hearing people's stories often will inspire me to, uh, maybe write a song for them mm-hmm. or, um, find songs. So I guess, I guess I would, Feel feel that I'm a song centered music therapist. Uh-huh. It seems like that's sort of the, my go to is. So there's different. There's different. Uh, so when you say you're a song centered music therapist, that gives me the impression there's other other ways to use music besides songs. Yeah, um, you know I don't know if that's an actual label that you can find, but that's sort of how I consider yeah. myself. And um, you know, there's there's a lot of techniques in music therapy, like um, um, sort of matching the uh the uh emotional state of a person with with sound right. and then carrying okay. taking that and then exactly. uh, sort of car- taking it somewhere that's maybe healing you know or more of a you know positive so if somebody is you know uh-huh. you know having a struggling with something mm-hmm. um you know there's techniques that you could use maybe just with ooze and right. improvised guitar mm-hmm where you sort of match where they're at and then take that and move it somewhere. And it's, it's, and I've seen that done really, you know, but my teachers and seen it done really effectively. Right. Um, but I'm more apt to, it, my mind goes to a song uh-huh. and I, I was saying that, and then the, the song cycle will evolve, you know? Well, that's your, that's what you bring. That's what I bring. Yeah. Right. Uh, what you're describing to me sounds like uh, something I know to be called music thanatology, um, Mm -hmm. where it's, the song is what you bring, but those folks that actually don't bring necessarily a song, but they do bring music and sound. Right. And they do it at a time I've often heard that, um, uh, my understanding of that is often there will be harpists. Yeah. that are used mm-hmm. in the in the in the actual actively dying phase right. of, of, of what is happening and right. they'll use the harp not necessarily trying to create a classical piece or mm-hmm. anything like that but just using their own sense of what's happening with the person yeah and and absolutely then, uh, it's quite creating, an art yeah I suspect so and so it is to create uh, the songs that you create uh, to take somebody's story and put it in uh, to a, you know, based on a life story, putting it into a brief context, but telling the whole story Mm -hmm. that that's an art. Yeah. It's (laughs) yeah. That is the art of, of music therapy around song, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I, 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 I feel that that must be so, um, it must be a really good feeling that you have to be able to do that for somebody. Oh yeah. It's great. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. They get, and they get to, um, experience their story reflected back. Right. Right. Yeah, it's it's the power it's the power of of the right song at the right time. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Right. And so, as you are doing music therapy in this part of the world in these mountains, I don't know if this is true or not, but I suspect there's an opportunity for a few porch sessions. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, I was grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Sit sit out and watch the birds fly by and. Uh huh play some old mountain songs that's hardly feels like work you know <laughs> well exactly i suspect so yeah. um and i don't know how many how many folks do you have that say well let's get out out here and play a little something together that that happens occasionally yeah i'm really grateful when that does happen i just uh i just had a, a 
client who who you know recently died but he was very much alive when i was seeing him and he would take out his harmonica and he would actually get up and dance uh -huh. and play and just oh, even yeah. you know weep sometimes with the joy of being able to do this you know just you know it's just great your uh opening hearts it yeah like. yeah it's 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 just bringing this opportunity that you know uh -huh. at the end of life it's it's a it's a poignant time in a person's life and they're looking back on all of their memories and they're also thinking about the meaning of their life and they're thinking about where they might be going next and mm -hmm. you know it's so it's 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 um it's a pretty amazing thing to to walk into you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. and to meet a person at that point yeah in their life you right. know, for the first time and meeting these meeting people when they're really open a lot of times and i suspect the oper the, the ability that you have to be able to sit down um, with your in, your guitar and just open that door wide open. I mean, so often, even if somebody is is not necessarily open in that first visit, um, because they're just not sure what's going on. And right, um, I suspect that that door opens up pretty quickly when you uh, start playing. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, and and it goes back to what we we're talking about with the, the right song. I mean. You know, just speaking with somebody for a few minutes, often they'll let me know what the right song is. And then when they hear that reflected back to them, well, that's the key right there. The doors are open. Right, you know? right. And from then on, they stay open. Yeah, exactly. Uh, knowing when not to play Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Still waiting on the Jimi Hendrix yeah. request. <laughs> Hadn't seen that yet. I no. know, but I did have Black Sabbath. Yeah. You did? I did, yeah. That was the right song. That was the right song, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, I had to learn it first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you um, you have some songs in your pocket uh, today and uh, that reflect those stories sure. that you're talking about. So, Jay, tell me about this song you're getting ready to play. Uh, sure. Which one do you want to work with? This is uh, called Living Man. Mm -hmm. It's a song I wrote for um, a client uh, in music therapy in the hospice uh, named Anthony. Uh -huh. And uh, he, he wanted me to use his real name when I talked about this song. So, um, I had known him for a couple of years, I think. It might have been about a year and a half before I wrote this song. Uh -huh. And... Um, so I knew all about, you know, the music he loved and the things that he was struggling with. And so I really wanted to um, connect uh -huh. with him and kind of um, give him a song that was meant just for him, just for my heart. Yeah. And at the same time, I wanted to tell him a little bit about me and, you know, what, what you know, sort of what I believed in and where I was coming from. And mm -hmm. I felt like the best way to do that was with a song. So, uh. I wrote this song for him, and you know, he he. Uh, after that, he always told me he was the living man. So that's what we call him. After that, he's the right. living man. Right. So it was a really power. It was one of the one of the sort of peak times of, in my career as a music therapist when I played this song for him. And I always remember like our, our way of sort of saying what's up was you know like the fist bump. You know, like uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. And I played this song for him. He put his fist up, and I put mine up to his, and it just held them there together for about two minutes solid, you know, oh, just a real moment. Yeah. So, so that was, that was our song. And anytime I'd see him after that, he said, got to play the living man. You know? <laughs> I hear and that. And uh, he told me I need to get it down on wax. He said, I need to get it recorded. So I, I would go to my dad's studio and, you know, do a take of it. And I'd come back and play it for him, you know, put the headphones on him and, you know, he'd have his eyes closed and he'd be listening to it. And, and like, I remember the first time he said it, you cut it too short, man. It's I, I needed I needed longer to get into it, you know. Yeah. So I go back and I extend it and put some more. Oh. You know, like a long, <laughs> drawn out ending uh -huh. to it. And yeah. Finally got it to where he was digging it. You know, he finally uh -huh. was ready to be put out. So it was cool. You know, we were like co-creators of this. Uh huh. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. So I always think about Anthony when I play this song. So here's Living one man. for Anthony. Yeah. Uh huh. Living man.
Well, when I look at you, I don't see a dying man. Oh, no. I see a living man. Lord knows we cannot know the mysterious master plan. But we can feel our way and we can keep on living. You might be thinking you lost your destiny, but you still got time. The work of living and finding harmony doesn't end with dying. When the master spoke, he spoke in poetry, my Lord. Yes, this is known to me. I believe the Holy Ghost is part of you and me. And the soul lives in eternity. might be thinking you lost your destiny but you still got time the work of living and finding harmony doesn't end with dying when i look at you i don't see a dying man oh, I see a living man The pain and tears in life Bring grace and growth within My friend I pray you keep on living <laughs> I can see why he wanted it to keep on going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He sort of wanted to meditate at the end of it. You know, I, kind of get I found myself doing that. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's quite a song. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. You're listening to WPVM FM at 103.7 here in Asheville, North Carolina. You can also listen on WPVM.org. This program is sponsored in part by the Mountain Coalition for Healthcare Decisions, and we're grateful for their support. We're back with Jay Brown, a local musician and recording artist, and also a music therapist here in the Asheville area. So what do you have for us now, Jay? So I'll play a song called Moonflower, Okay. which is a, uh, this was a collaboration mm-hmm. that I, I did with... Uh, one of my hospice clients whose name was Hope. Mm-hmm. 
and she um, she was living in a nursing home. Yeah. And uh, really didn't want to be living in that nursing home. She was 90 years old and had lived a long life of creativity and service. And she was a poet, among other things. And uh, she just didn't feel like she belonged there, you know, didn't mm-hmm. know how she ended up there. But um, she, uh, like I said, had been a poet. And I thought, would you like to try to write one more? She was uh, into that idea. But I talked to her, and she would sort of her her mind would wander, mm-hmm. and it was hard for me to you know get um, too much concise you know th- too many concise thoughts yeah. out of her. At any time. Except this one time, it was she. It was just sort of magical. She was just uh, um, free flow of consciousness, just saying all these things, and it was very poetic. And so I was writing it all down as she was saying it, oh. and uh, I said, I think I have your next poem right here. And so I took it home and just arranged it a little bit, you know, Uh Uh and turned it into a song and brought it back to her and had a CD for her. And she, you know, she's really proud of that. And she put that on her, um, you know, when she died on her funeral program, that was, that was on there. So it was her last poem and, you know, Mm -hmm. she was proud of it and I was proud of it as well. What a, um, what a powerful thing to, um, to be able to, um, create, the space for, um, well, the power I'm speaking of, I think, is the space of, creativity doesn't sound like the right word, but um, there's a story that's being told. Yeah. Uh, You know, she has the opportunity to tell you a story, even if it's um, in bits and pieces. Right. And you are listening to that story. You can say, oh, yeah, I see the story. Yeah, um, just some of her soul just shining through, you know, just uh-huh. with her, just um, free flow of words that she was speaking that day. It's, it's really neat to see and hear. That is a that is such a gift because how else would that free flow of words that she shared with you have had any meaning to anybody else? Right, right. It's so easy, especially in a in a long term care facility, and and if she loses her train of thought often, and the nature of the environment being what it is, and people just uh, may be willing to spend more time, but don't often feel like they can spend the kind of time that you're spending with them, so that you can actually take her words, put it into a form that you can reflect back to her and then she gets to experience it again. Um, and she knows that that's her song. Right. Wow. Yeah. 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 I suspect she had a bit of a smile when she heard it. She did. She wanted it repeated a few times. (laughs) (laughs) Of course. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I hear that. (laughs) Yeah. Let's repeat. Let's do it again. (laughs) Yeah. Let's hear that again. It was sweet. And her daughter came and she, of course, her daughter had to hear it a few times as well. Yeah. Yeah. I suspect they still listen to it often. I hope so. (laughs) So what's the name of the song? This is called Moonflower. Moonflower. Wonderful. hardest time of night All my memories are in the sunshine The miracles and the fun times Little birds hovering around my flower seeds 
I just can't believe some of the mysteries Living and giving what we're here for All these little miracles Like the moonflower Wow. <laughs> I was just uh, vision, envisioning her uh, speaking that to you and then just listening to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah the imagery and, and what she said was just so, so powerful. Yeah. And, thought, and yeah. she basically uh, wrote those words. With, she did. Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, edited, you know, <laughs> right. took out a few things that right. she said. But yeah, it was just. So she had a message for all of us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and luckily there was somebody there to you know, record it and make something out oh, of it. Oh, yeah. Like I said earlier, I think the power of having the opportunity for somebody to be present enough to pay attention to um, and write it down and then to create such a such a powerful song as that for her to hear, but we all get to hear it. Right. <laughs> and you, you think about how many gems are like that that just go unseen you know or unheard yeah in, in you know places like his nursing homes and yeah they need they need a they need someone listening yeah they need someone listening yeah very true thank you for that one it occurs to me that with the the work you do in music therapy and i know that you do a a, a lot of uh a lot of recording of many different uh uh types of music, uh, not necessarily as a music therapist and you, and you do a wonderful job at that, but it occurs to me, you could do a whole concert on <laughs> the songs that you have, uh, participated with others in. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. My, um, my mom was always telling me I, I need to make a music therapy album. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I echo her words. So, uh, -huh. uh <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, you know, I guess I would have to just get the, uh, the, uh, the okay from everybody who's part of you know, the songs sure. that, that I wrote. Well, of course, of course, that would be quite a concert. It'd be very, uh, I think everybody would kind of float out of the concert probably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could be a few tears. <laughs> a few <laughs> tears are good from me. Anyway. Tears. Are, yeah. Yeah. That I, I suspect so. It's yeah. hard to sing when you're choked up. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that too. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. That's right. It's all part of it. So what do we have? Uh, what, what's this song about? Well, here is um, a song that is recently written for a, a client that I, that I have now. Um, his name is Tom. Um, he's, he has uh, end-stage Parkinson's. Uh -huh. So he's not able to communicate with words you know, very much. He'll, he'll get out a few a few key things at key times mm -hmm. but um I, I really feel like i know him you know partly just from his presence from the things that he does say from his smile his laugh when he laughs mm -hmm. and uh and from his wife who is always there by his side and as he tells me about him and so we reminisce a lot during the sessions and so i had been seeing him for uh several months um when i asked I brought the, the idea up of a song, you know, early on, and then I sort of came back and revisited that um, recently. And they said, well, they had been thinking of some things to put in the song, and so they gave me some stories and some things that they thought might be good to, to put in a song about Tom, about his life. Mm -hmm. And he, he lived uh, a really uh, colorful and unique life. He, he was a photographer and uh, taught photography in... Um, in a university and just uh just a cool soul you know just mm -hmm. he had a, just sort of an artist eye an artist way of going through life you know it seemed like a laid-back person and found a lot of humor in life mm -hmm. so he you know i was um hearing some of the stories of like just funny things he would do like there's one story where they had their niece was there mm -hmm staying for for a few days and she was maybe 10 years old or so and um among other things tom was a beekeeper mm. and uh he had gotten stung by several bees and his arm had swollen up like the incredible hulk like three <laughs> times his size 
and there was um, some medicine that they put on that turned his arm blue. It was like a blue cream. So he oh. had this huge blue arm, <laughs> you know, if you can picture that. Yeah. And so his niece was staying in the room, just maybe hanging out on the bed, reading a book or something. And all of a sudden, here's this huge blue arm <laughs> waving through the door saying, ah, <laughs> just the shriek, you know, that came from that. <laughs> Things like that. I thought, well, that's got to go in this song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and there's another story where he uh, he was driving in a blizzard, and he stopped at this bakery, and they happened to be open. They they went to this bakery often, and um, he was the only customer of the day. So he came. He went to get one loaf, and he ended up like they filled his entire. SUV or whatever it was, he was driving full of bread. Oh yeah. So he ended, it was almost like the loaves and fishes kind of yeah, story. Yeah, I just had know? that thought. <laughs> yeah. And then there's another story where he was um, on a road trip with his family, and all of a sudden he just pulled over the car, and you know his family said, "What's going on?" He said, "Just wait." And he just walked out. I don't know where they were, what state they were in. Just walked out um, to this field and was just standing still as a statue, and then suddenly he raised his arm. And his wife said the ground just moved. Well, what it was, was it was like an ocean of frogs had gathered in this one place and they were just still. And when he moved his arm up, they all moved oh. and it looked like the earth just moved. And so, you know, his family would always remember that. Oh yeah. Just cool things like that. Yeah. So, um, he often would start a story by saying, this is a true story. So that's the name of this. This, <laughs> this is, is a, a true, true story. story. <laughs> yeah, so. This is a true story Moments move in the years Pictures playing their tricks It's how it appears Not what it depicts And it appears There was love in the cabin Gentle smiles and easy laughing Black and white photographing That isn't all that black and white Your lady shares your cabin fever You never knew how much you'd need her You only knew the way to treat her Was to love her every day and night This is a true story Moments move in the years, pictures playing their tricks It's how it appears, not what it depicts And it appears there are friends and relations Fun on family vacations The family filled with inspiration at the miracle of moving frogs The great outdoors were yours for walking The stars would fall like leaves in autumn Good friends are kept around for talking Like goats and chickens, bees and dogs This is a true story Moments moving the years, pictures playing the tricks It's how it appears, not what it depicts And it appears you are loved by precious people Todd, Aaron, Becker, and Melinda The thought of you makes them feel tender and fills them full of gratitude With plenty growing in your garden And all those projects you are starting Nothing ventured, nothing gotten Like praying mantis multitudes
This is a true story. Moments moving the years, pictures playing their tricks. It's how it appears, not what it depicts. And it appears there was plenty to laugh at. A big blue arm appeared to grab at. And Wanda threw up in the nun's habit. Thus avenging your first day of school. And the time you drove home in a blizzard. And like some transcendental wizard. You made one low fill 20 freezers. The perks of being kind and cool. This is a true story Moments moving the years, pictures playing their tricks It's how it appears, not what it depicts And it appears there was love in the cabin And it appears there were friends and relations It appears there was plenty to laugh at and it appears you are loved by precious people. <laughs> that one creates a little, ooh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I should mention the, uh, some of the lines are his. Uh, it's how it appears, not what it depicts. It's, that's how he had described his art and his photography. Oh, yeah. Well, there's photography all through. I mean, uh, you can't listen to that song knowing the knowing the story, especially. So I'm grateful you you shared the uh, the reasons that those verses came together. Because I mean, I'm going on a little journey yeah. when you sing that song. Yeah, yeah. It's a little snapshot of a life. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. That's yeah. a you could probably do an entire movie script on that song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen worse. So yeah, oh, that, yeah. I mean that that's beautiful. That's yeah. really quite something. Yeah. Is he still uh, holding space in this world? He is. He is. Yeah, uh -huh. I'll go see him tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. And uh he's had an opportunity to uh to experience the song? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, he has a CD now of it and he plays it for everyone that uh -huh. he sees. His wife, you know, shares it with everyone that that they come in contact with. So. Oh, here again, yeah. what a gift. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. Um, you're likely going to have a lot of people wanting you to write their last songs if you don't already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Veronica already asked about that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. She's yeah. fun that way, but yeah. I, I told that. her if I'm around, you know, I'll, right. I'll do my best. Well, <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking of myself and I'm thinking, well, that just would be a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. So I've got a uh, I've got my own story around music and uh, that season of dying also and uh, you know three years ago my my wife died unexpectedly and uh, as it is with that phase of life there there is a period of mourning uh, which is expected and natural and during that time um, music of course spoke to me and there are songs that I can't listen to now without. Um, reflecting on that uh, the feelings even and the i mean the feelings come back the season of that time uh shows itself and not in a bad way in a way that is just um the story and it's another season another chapter one of those songs was um and when i die blood sweat and tears mm -hmm. if you might remember that yeah. one <laughs> that yeah. one uh, certainly surfaced as a bit of a theme song during that time but the other song was uh what what i know to be called dink song or fare thee well, and uh, I'd be honored if uh, if you'd be willing to uh, sing that together a little bit here. It'd just uh, would love to be, be good therapy for me again. <laughs> All right, <laughs> wonderful. So uh, so this is Dink's song. Noah's dove, 
I'd fly the river to the one I love. Fare thee well, my honey. Fare thee well. I had a man who was long and tall, who moved his body like a cannonball. Fare thee well, my honey, fare thee well. I remember one evening in the pouring rain, and in my heart was an aching pain. Fare thee well, my honey, fare thee well. Number nine train won't do you no harm. Number nine train took my honey home. Fare thee well, my honey. Fare thee well. So show me some birds flying high above. Life ain't worth living. Without the one you love, fare thee well, my honey, fare thee well. Fare thee well, my honey, fare thee well. Oh, my goodness. I can see what you mean about it. it gets a little difficult to sing if you're almost choked up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's good medicine, though. Yes, it Thanks is. so much. Thanks Thank so you. much for that. Jay, why do you think that um, if um, I suspect some people think um, that music therapy is just somebody coming to play some music, uh, which is true. But there's more to it than that, mm -hmm. isn't there? It's yeah. not just uh, filling the silence with song. Right. Um, yeah, most often when people hear music therapy, they think very soft, beautiful, soothing music where a person will just passively receive that. Mm -hmm. And that is one part of music therapy that, you know, that can happen. Mm -hmm. But music therapy is, is, is so vast. Uh, any... any any way that you can bring music into a situation that is helpful, mm -hmm. you know, is music therapy. So it could even be having a conversation with somebody. You know, I've had sessions where, you know, the guy didn't necessarily want to hear music or play. He just wanted to talk about, you know, Motown or, you know, uh -huh. just that sort of thing. And, you know, I would get a song or two in, but that wasn't really you yeah. know, what it was about. And then I've had other, I had one, uh, client who had been a music therapist mm -hmm. and she was an amazing musician she had been a classical organist so the therapy there was she became my teacher oh, and so yeah. i would you know struggle through some bach and she would tell me what i needed to do to you know to, to make it better and then i'd work on it and bring it back to her and she'd note the progress and we'd go from there so you know in any way you can use music um had a client who was a poet and she was incredibly prolific and mm -hmm. she loved to share her poems so I would go and she would recite her poems on her little handheld uh, recording device and I would improvise music or play some you know some mountain music depending on mm -hmm. what the poem sounded like and mm -hmm. She would, and we just had so much fun. She was just like a little girl when she would, when we would do this, and she looked forward to it all week. And you know, yeah. I looked forward to it as well. And she'd put them on these 
beautiful CDs that she'd decorate and she'd send them out to everybody that she knew mm-hmm. and get letters back from them saying how much they loved it. So that was, that was music therapy there. Yeah. So it's just, it's so vast, you know, what, what you can do with music. Well, I suspect, well, I know this to be the case, but I'd like to hear your words about it as well. And that is, um, when we think about music and just being comfortable and energetic, that somebody, I suspect you have some experiences where folks who are in a state of being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. physically, Mm -hmm. um, uncomfortable emotionally, uh, depressed or, or, or afraid, Mm -hmm. um, and probably a hundred other words that we could use. Um, what happens in the relationship that you offer them is, well, you just, you just mentioned it about this woman that, um, had the energy, I'm paraphrasing, but had the energy of a child. Mm -hmm. She just absolutely jumped at it. Yeah. Right. So I, I suspect that, uh, if you were watching that, you're looking at uh, symptoms that improve, even physical symptoms. Do you see that to be a part of it? Definitely, yeah. And that's a big part of what you know we're supposed to do mm-hmm. is to help. And we and we're you know we're supposed to diagnose a set of um, objectives that we that we really want to focus on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could be agitation, or um, you know, it could be um, depression, things like that. And so you mm-hmm. know, we have to document in our notes. Right, you know how we're addressing that, and and how effective it's it's being. You know, wow. That uh, I would uh, love for you to be in my team if I'm ever in need. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Likewise, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so um, ultimately, um, what you bring is is has such a beauty and a power to it, and I'm I'm grateful and honored that you're willing to come and, and share some time with us. And, uh, uh, so that, uh, we could hear a little bit more about what's going on in that, in that realm. Oh yeah. Of, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. We have the goal of cultivating the sacred art of being with dying. And I think you just, uh, hammered it home. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I, I wish that you go well, Jay. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate thank, that. Thanks very much. Thanks for everything you do. Okay. This is Mary Gurudev, which means my love, recorded by Jason Hebel, Saeed Osio, and myself under the name Akteshna Anna. call out to my love 
now make me your instrument. My love. To my Abba. Everything I have is dedicated to you. My love. Everything I am is dedicated to you. To my now Abba. make me your instrument. You are the one I call out to. And in my thoughts, you are the one who is in my heart. My every atom is dedicated to you, my love. I don't even have the strength to worship you, but this mind of mine, this body of mine, is dedicated to you, my love. Nor do I truly know you. And I dedicate it all to you. I have no love, but I dedicate it all to you. I offer these flowers of my faith at your feet, my love. And I dedicate it all to you. There you go. That's about it for today. This program is produced by Third Messenger. Our story editor is Saeed Osio, our producer Jason Hebel, and I'm your host, Greg Lathrop. Thanks for joining us, and go well. Thank you.